But I want to say thanks to the Adult Education Committee and, and Louise and Lorraine for all the work they've done to put this series together. I've got about a 45-minute presentation. The name of this presentation is Florence and the Italian Renaissance, the Northern Italian Renaissance, and I'm going to be talking about some basic themes of the pretty big challenge to, to say anything terribly meaningful about several hundred years of history, which a lot happened. Uh, but uh, we're going to try, and so we have to start, if not for your sake, certainly for mine, with a few disclaimers. I am not an expert on the Renaissance. Um, I, uh, uh, for various reasons I'll describe in a moment, have an interest in that period of history, and uh, certainly the period just before it, which involves Dante and the, the time when he lived. Uh, I am certainly an amateur, uh, and uh, we sort of denigrate amateurs as uh, being dilettantes or not knowing. Really, an amateur comes from the French word for lover. I just want to remind you I'm a lover and not a scholar here. Okay. There are probably people in this room who will know a lot more about the Renaissance than I do, and I hope that you, that you may have to correct me on some of this. But what I want to do is just give us a flavor for some of the important currents that were going on during that period of history in Northern Europe, and specifically Northern Italy, that, that really had a big influence on the Western mind and really prepared the ground for the Reformation. So with that in mind, why Florence? Um, as you know, I'm a real fan of Dante. And uh, I kind of got into uh, Dante because of the last sabbatical that I took in the year 2000. I was studying the poetry of T.S. Eliot, and T.S. Eliot, in his great poem, Four Quartets, does an homage to Dante. And I'm like, who's this guy Dante? I was led into some uh, commentator that really just sparked a love for his poetry. Uh, and I hope I can share some of that with you next next week. But, of course, Florence is the city of Dante living just before the period of the Renaissance, uh, and uh, the theme of the sabbatical that I took this past summer uh, surround, focuses, focused on spirituality and the arts. And certainly Florence is a great place to explore that theme, a place of, uh, where one can, uh, one can view great art during a period of history when great art was flourishing, the Renaissance. Um, some of you have asked, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, who wants to hear about someone's summer it was a vacation, but uh, sabbatical. But I did want to say something about what many sacrificed so that we could do. Uh, and uh, I want to say once again thank you to the staff, the whole staff, Louise, all of you for enabling me to do this. But I just wanted to report back to you on some of the things that I did during my sabbatical. I got a Lilly Endowment grant with the help of a lot of people who helped me write that and uh, was able to do some things certainly I never could afford to do without it. And the purpose of uh, the Lilly Endowment Clergy Renewal Program is to provide a period of rest and renewal for clergy. It also uh, provides money to cover somebody in their absence, and that helped us give uh, some, uh, buy some extra staff time while I was away. Um, and it was, it's meant also to provide benefit for the church. And there will hopefully be some benefits that you see from the time that I spent uh, while I was away, some of the work that I'm going to be doing with Louise that will continue to bear fruit um, ongoing. So what did I do? First thing I did in, uh, in May was I brought together five other colleagues who were spread throughout the country, and we went to a dude ranch in Colorado. Um, we learned from each other and had a time together to talk about what, is it, what does it mean in your context to do ministry? What do we need to know to do ministry with excellence, with our attack? Uh, and it may turn out to be an ongoing group that gathers every year, sort of a co-op, uh, a, a consortium to do continuing education. We'll see. If not, it was a wonderful time uh, at this dude ranch in Colorado. As I spoke about in my sermon, I did an eight-day Ignatian retreat. It was a silent retreat, except for one hour a day, in which I sat down with a, a spiritual director and was given exercises based on St. Ignatius's uh, spiritual exercises. And by the way, if anybody has any impulse to do this, if you have the time, it's very reasonable in cost. Um, it's a place in Pennsylvania, and it was a really powerful experience for me um, to practice really the presence and love of God uh, in, in a very practical way based on the teachings of St. Ignatius. Uh, I did an, a week-long a week intensive improv acting class in uh, New York City, and that was really fun. I think it, it will help me in my preaching and in other parts of my work, and I had a chance to experience New York City. I stayed in New York City because uh, there was money in the grant for that. 
Um, the focus, though, of, the, of my sabbatical time was really time spent in this city that we're going to explore today uh, in the next several weeks, Florence. Um, I spent two weeks there. I spent uh, several, uh, two weeks prior to that, or a week and a half prior to that in various cities in northern Italy. Uh, but a week and a half of that time in Florence was with my family, and we did a, a time of cru- a cruise after that. Uh, and it was really a wonderful, uh, an amazing privilege to be able to do that. Um, so here are some pictures of northern Italy, a typical street scene from Rimini, I went first in the time before I I traveled to Florence uh, to Ravenna, which is where Dante was buried, and I visited uh, Dante's tomb, paid homage. Uh, I stayed in a uh, town in the center of northern Italy, Spoleto. Jim Moyer is a real fan of this place. It's in Umbria, and Assisi is a town near uh, Spoleto, so I visited the Cathedral of St. Francis, saw a number of wonderful Giotto frescoes there. It's a really impressive place to go if you have the means. The third place I stayed before going to Florence was a, a place on the western coast, an island called Monte de Argentario. And uh, what I would do is I would write in the morning and I would travel in the afternoon. It happens that I visited an island near this place called Giglio Island, and I didn't realize until all the passengers in this ferry crowded onto one side of the boat that this is where the Costa Concordia ran aground, uh, and you can kind of see, can you see the boat there? It's just an incredible monument to human frailty, uh, to, to Calvinist, Calvin's idea of, uh, of our human frailty, and I became fascinated with the story of the Costa Concordia and the captain who was impressing his girlfriend. Uh, so, anyway... At last, we digress. We had some time together as a family, and this is uh, we visited a winery at one point. The highlight, I, so people ask me, like, what was the most, the best moment during your sabbatical? And I, the thing that immediately came to mind was, this was the summer when my son said, it was the best summer of my life. And, uh, <laughs> uh, this is toward the end, we, in Hyannisport, which is where uh, we serve a little chaplain. Dana is also one of the summer ministers, uh, but uh, I don't know if anybody can name the person here in the yellow dress. Anybody know? Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift was dating one of the Kennedys, so uh, she was seen several times in the little village of Hyannisport and uh, happened to be going down the beach where my son Will uh, and two friends uh, were hanging out, and the two friends said, hey, come on over here and take a picture of so, yourself. That was one of the highlights. So, where have we got? We've, we've wandered pretty far from Florence here. Um, some of the other things that I did, I finished the first draft of a novel I've been working on called Galiotto. Uh, it's a word that comes from the Divine Comedy, and people ask me, well, what it's about? This is the latest elevator summary. It's a novel about a suicidal Presbyterian minister who rediscovers faith through a journey with people who are anything but Christian. The thematic backdrop is Dante, and uh, I usually don't write about characters who are so close to my own persona. Hopefully I'm not a suicidal pastor, but it's about a guy who runs off the rails, sort of falls into hell, and through that experience finds a new faith um, through some very awful experiences with some very colorful characters, sort of like Dante. I spend some of my time developing an arts component with what we're calling our Faith Formation Network. You'll be hearing more about that in the coming months. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to developing that with Louise and others. Um, I started to develop a blog about liturgy and the literary arts. And uh, Jake Willard Christ and Lee Stuckey are also uh, supporting that effort with me. Uh, time in the shop, time for exercise and renewal. Um, I spent some Thursday mornings at uh, the Trenton Area Soup Kitchen's SHARE program, which writes poetry. It's a program to help people who go to the soup kitchen write poetry, and I, I love my Thursday afternoons going there, and I'm continuing to do that. So those were just some of the things that I did. But part of my study was, again, around the, uh, the, the, the figure of Dante and uh, around Florence, and particularly this period called the Renaissance. Uh, and... Uh, I think that it's pretty, well, I'll I'll say in a minute, it's pretty tough to say anything, but just to give up, uh, to describe some themes that come out of this period uh, in history. And I'm going to focus some of the learning on a particular place. We're going to be inductive here uh, and next Sunday as well. We're going to look at 
begin at this particular place, uh, the Baptistry of San Giovanni. We're going to study a canto of Dante's where he does something in this very space, a very old building. Uh, and uh, it's a place that really bespeaks an era, the era that preceded the Renaissance. It says something about the period of the Renaissance. It's a symbol of the city of Florence. And it really bespeaks a history, again, that came before the Renaissance and that uh, it says something about what happens during the Renaissance. And I'll be saying more about that later on in this presentation. Uh, I thought this would be kind of cool. This is on the uh, website. Uh, these days you can take a kind of virtual tour. There we go. Okay, so here's the Duomo. You can see how incredibly ornate this building is. It's sort of the history of Renaissance is written into its architecture in many ways. But right, you see there's the main door. And right here is the baptistry. You can kind of see the doors of the baptistry over here. Giberti's doors um, are right there. Uh, and uh, Professor Froelich is going to spend more time talking about that. But here it is. Um, with two different color limestone, an octagonal building. Anybody know why eight sides? It's where people would be baptized, especially on Easter. And after being baptized, they would go from those doors, those bronze doors, into the main doors of the cathedral to be welcomed by the community of faith. Eight-sided because there are how many days of creation? The eighth day. Well, you like to... There's a whole theological conversation. Is, is the day of rest a day of creation? There's always say that that's an important part of creation. It's not creating. But the eighth day of creation is the apocalypse. Is the day when it will all be complete. It's not quite finished yet. So the eighth day is the day of apocalypse. So eight-sided octagonal building. And I'll say a little bit more about it. Um, there's a, a virtual tour of the inside, too. I'm not going to show you at this point. Uh, but uh, you can see that on the website. There are a whole bunch of places where you can um, take a virtual tour. Uh, and I put a number of, uh, of uh, resources on the website if you want to do some further study. So what is the Renaissance? Literally, it means rebirth, French word. We might ask, you know, rebirth, what was the first birth? What was the original birth? What are we being reborn after? And I'll say a little bit about that in a moment. It follows a period of history that's often been called the Middle Ages. It was called the Dark Ages. That's probably in many ways inaccurate. It's just because scholars didn't know exactly what was going on in various places from the 5th through the 14th century. 5th century is the end of the Roman Empire when the Germanic tribes came and invaded from the north. Uh, and uh, so it's, uh, the Middle Ages span roughly from the end of the Roman Empire through the 14th century. Um, the Renaissance was, of course, a period of intense creativity and discovery, the discovery of human capacities. Uh, and we can argue about exactly when, but roughly the 14th through the 17th centuries. And it really began in northern Italy. And we're going to explore um, in a moment. Why, why is that? So as I said, difficult to speak of this vast period of history um, in, in, in any way other than a suggestive way no way we can be exhausted in treating any one theme. But I want to just lift up some broad brushstrokes themes from the Renaissance that I think are true and instructive, distinct ways that this period of time had a huge impact on our way of thinking as Western people, um, cultural and social influences that came about during that time. It's really the birth of the modern in certain ways, although every period of history they think of, we think of ourselves as modern. I guess maybe we think of this period of history as postmodern. Uh, but many of the things that make our modern culture happen during this period of time and originated in this place. Uh, so, let's begin. Why did it begin in Italy? Um, Italy was a place that had some unique characteristics and a uh, circumstance that was in some ways unique in Northern Europe so that it was fertile ground for this uh, cultural process to begin. Uh, Northern Italy was a place where urbanization was happening a bit more radically, uh, uh, a bit more dramatically than in other places. So the formation of city-states like Florence started happening. Okay, of course, in that time, we, we, people wouldn't have a consciousness of being Italian. And, and today, they probably wouldn't be able to, many folks don't have that primary consciousness about their nationality. They say, I'm Umbrian. I'm not so much, I mean, they come around, they, they, uh, uh, find unity often when it's the soccer match, you know, in the European Cup. And I was in Umbria and Spoleto when they were in the quarterfinals of the European Cup. 
Cup. Everybody was an Italian then. People went into the soccer stadium in town, and it, this was being broadcast in Eastern Europe, but you could hear the cheers going up uh, in my hotel room every time they scored a goal. So there are places like Florence, which were a country, Florence was a country unto itself with its own system of government. So was Venice. Uh, uh, Florence was a form of democracy. It was a rotating leadership. Some were forms of oligarchy where there was a ruling family, a duchy. Uh, so it was a place also that was starting to soften up in terms of its social form of organization that had been based on a feudal society. And so we know much of Northern Europe is organized socially in terms of a, a feudal uh, social stratification. The traditional classes, uh, would, or we might call them the states of the realm, um, that had been very much fixed. If you were born into one of these stations, you're not going to move anywhere. The three sort of broad categories of social class in this feudal society that dominated most of Europe would have been the clergy, the three estates, the clergy, the nobility, and the peasantry. The peasantry would have included not just poor people, but doctors and lawyers and guilds and that sort of thing. There was this idea that if you're a carpenter, your son's going to be a carpenter. You know, your dad was probably a carpenter. There's no, I want you to go off and uh, become a doctor or a lawyer, certainly prior to this time. Uh, if you were born into that, you were born into it. There was no moving up or down. If you were born a member of the nobility, it was your role, it was your divine lot to be that role and to stay in that role. But we see in this period of history that a new class emerges that might be sort of a, a hybrid class called the merchant class. Um, now let's talk a little bit about why that happened. Uh, according to the law of primogeniture, which was a very important kind of cultural law in the time of the Middle Ages, it's the idea that the firstborn, if you're a you the Lord, if you're a noble and you're a landowner and you have a large manor and uh, you would have probably serfs working the land, they would owe you their labor and they would give a certain portion of their crops, uh, you would pass that land along to the firstborn son. What would happen if you passed the land along to, let's say you had three sons, and all three sons in equal measure, you, know, you have three different parcels of land when they were going to pass it on, they passed on their three sons. It would quick, quickly get subdivided, and the family name would be would be lost. And so it was very important that the firstborn son carry on the family name and continue this form of life uh, for if you were a noble family. But what if you're the second son? You're not gonna you're gonna get something of an inheritance. You're going to get some money. But in the time before the Renaissance and the Middle Ages, typically what you do is you go off and be a mercenary, uh, fight battles. Um, but uh, what was happening in this period of time in the Renaissance is that uh, nobles who had the means, uh, who had their inheritance, would go off to the cities and would begin <laughs> trading, would begin engaging in commerce. Um, and so this is the start of an economy that creates excess capital. So one of the things, of course, that fuels the creation of art, as we all know, is cash. This period of history, and in particular in these city-states in northern Italy, saw a really huge commercial expansion that was a global expansion. It had to do with trading internationally, the trade in spices. Florence was a center of banking. Uh, they were bankers to the Pope. Uh, there were other important mercantile ventures that started to emerge during that period of time, like printing. Printing was the means also by which ideas were exchanged. So it's a period of time when, you know, no longer was it just the church that had a monopoly on ideas. That we started seeing the free exchange of ideas through the invention of the printing press. In Florence, that was a source of, uh, of capital, of cash as well. And of course, why did it begin in northern Italy? That the Roman Empire that again ended in the 5th century. We have this thousand years of history between. And then it picks up. As people might think, we're, we're picking up where the Romans left off a thousand years before. That's why some scholars have referred to that period of history as the Dark Ages. So what, what is it that contributed in many ways to the flourishing of art? Maybe not so much faith, as we'll talk about in a moment. Is the flourishing of faith, it may have worked against the flourishing of faith, but what you need to create art is cash. 
uh, excess capital. Um, you need a lot of excess capital in a merchant class to invest in art and great public works. This statue here is the statue of Pericles uh, slaying the Medusa. And uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. It was commissioned by the Medici family. So what is the other thing that contributes to this vast expansion of art during that period of time? In a certain sense, it's built on human pride in its various forms. Uh, why is that? Let's just take a, an example. Um, institution, the institution of the church was really it during the, this period between the 5th and the 16th century. And I'm painting that with a very broad brushstroke. But what's happening here in northern Italy, especially in Florence, is the institution of certain families are taking over as some of the most important institutions in the society. In Florence, specifically the Medici family. This is a, the statue of Neptune. It's a, a fountain right in the middle of uh, Florence, right next to the Uffizi Gallery in one of the main squares. And uh, this gives you an idea of what's going on during the period of the Renaissance. Um, this statue was commissioned by uh, Cosmo Medici uh, after winning a great sea battle. It's, a, again, a statue of Neptune, so to sort of signify the power of the Florentians. But not just the power of the Florentians. Can you guess whose likeness that is <laughs> on the face of Neptune? That's Cosmo Medici. So here's a close-up. And everybody passing by that statue would know that Co that's Cosmo there. And he's looking out saying, that's right, I'm bad. Um, so the Medicis are a member of this mercantile class that's emerging. They might not have been traditional power family um, according to the feudal form of uh, so social organization. They might have been seen as kind of nouveau riche and beca became powerful because mm -hmm. of their ability to make money. They were bankers to the Pope and it became so powerful that they had a great deal of say at certain points in time about who would become Pope. Civic pride was a time when not only families became important in the way that the society was being organized, but the city-states themselves uh, were, as you could imagine, competitive. They often fought each other, fought wars with one another. So why would you invest in art? It's not just maybe many of us give to the, you know, the Philharmonic or we give to the arts because it's a good altruistic idea, but there's also something in it for us, not just to sort of elevate the family name, but civic pride. So we're going to talk a little bit about Brunelleschi's dome. Why is it the biggest dome in, in Europe uh, that was ever built at that time? Well... Uh, the city fathers knew that in Pisa there was a big cathedral that had been built with a big dome. And so here's, in some ways, why that was built. <laughs> Ours is bigger, <laughs> right? Um, Brunelleschi's dome was built upon a foundation that preceded the building of the dome itself. Uh, it, they raised the old cathedral, which was fairly small, right across from uh, the baptistry. And there was a big hole where the dome was to be put. And the problem was, you know, there was not the technology to build the dome. Um, the technology to build it didn't exist. They built the foundation just so it would be bigger than the Pisans' dome. Uh, but later on, uh, I think that was the 14th century when that was commissioned, and later on they, the town fathers held a, a contest to see who could design a dome to be built on top of the foundation that had already been built. And of course, you know, Brunelleschi... Uh, also uh, uh, put his name in. Uh, his chief rival was uh, Lorenzo Ghiberti. Thank Lorenzo you. Ghiberti and uh, Filippo Brunelleschi were rivals, uh, but uh, Brunelleschi won the won the bid because he said, "I can build it. I can build it cheaper than you are asking me to build it." And people were all wondering, "How is that possible? And, and how did he find the means and the technology to build it?" We could talk a long time about how Filippo Brunelleschi approached that. He had a brilliant uh, system for reinforcing the rings of the dome using a, a kind of a barrel hoop technology. Uh, he built flying uh, scaffolding instead of building it from the ground because wood was very expensive. So he had a very revolutionary uh, methodology, and in some ways he kept it secret from the town fathers and from his rivals. 
Uh, there's a great book called Brunelleschi's Dome that, you think, that I read before uh, going on my sabbatical that's really fascinating. Where did he turn to, though? Find the technology to do this. And this is illustrative of one of the themes I want to, to lift up that says something about this period of history. He didn't kind of look to new science, so to speak, the new science of architecture that was emerging during the Renaissance. It certainly was. But typical of the Renaissance, he looked back upon the ancients, upon <laughs> classical sources of wisdom. So what he did was, one of the architects who had uh, helped design the Pantheon in Rome, uh, some of his treatises were found. So he used some of the technology of ancient Rome uh, in, in crafting his own design. And you can kind of see that the, that the dome here, it's really thicker on the bottom and thinner on the top. That's one of the primary principles that Brunelleschi used in uh, creating his design for the Duomo, for the dome. Um, so that's, that, that bespeaks the spirit of the age. It's not the idea that the modern is where it's at. It's the idea that we have lost something uh, in forgetting and having forgotten the wisdom of our Greco-Roman forebears. So this, this is an era that follows on the rediscovery of Plato and Aristotle, who contribute to the theology of scholasticism, the theology of St. Thomas Aquinas. But this is really... A return to the classical era on steroids. There's even the idea that classical wisdom is superior to Christian faith. So how many of you have been to uh, the, the Uffizi and you see much of the Renaissance art? The subject is uh, Greek and Roman mythology. It was really hot, really very popular in those days. And so this is, uh, I guess, Raphael's um, School of Athens. And this is uh, Plato. And Aristotle. An interesting thing to notice here is you see, I guess that would be Plato. And he's pointing up because Plato is about it, he's an idealist. You know, we're going to point to the forms and try to get to the ideal thing in observing the particular. And Aristotle's got his hand down here. He's like, well, you know, we also need to pay attention to the earth to be, and we need to be practical. Mm -hmm. So, a little mini lesson in uh, ancient Greek philosophy. Let's go back to the baptistry of San Giovanni. Uh, it's Romanesque architecture. And so it's architecture that harks back to classical sources uh, and precedes this period of time. It's built upon a shrine to Mars, what was believed to be a pagan shrine, which was the most important place in, uh, in Florence, rededicated to the memory of St. John the Baptist. So it does kind of, I think, say something about the Renaissance in that it harks back to those earlier sources of wisdom that are non-Christian. Interesting thing is people then said we need a fitting counterpart to this building. We need to build a big church. To do that is going to highlight what an extraordinary human achievement that is, which is occasioned by the divine task. So this is an important theme too. You know, church isn't unimportant, but what starts to become more important in this period of history is... What God can do is important, but what is beginning here is the start of the age of individualism, when human achievement is being highlighted and celebrated. So it's the beginnings of the emphasis on individualism. It's the birth of modernity in the sense that this is the birth of this notion of the importance of the individual rather than the collective. And we could say a lot about that, uh, but we'll leave it at that for now. The Renaissance is a shift, beginnings of secular society, where the church is not the institution that is the arbiter of all truth. And so it started the beginning of a shift toward the marginalization of religion and the church. And let me just, uh, a few things to illustrate that. You couldn't, can't really talk about the Renaissance and not mention this the kind of tectonic, this huge controversial figure who is Machiavelli, and we probably all at least had some course in college or high school where we discussed Machiavelli and his book, The Prince. Uh, but you know, people were buying this book, flying off the shelves like hotcakes. What was controversial about that? It was a manual for rulers about how to be an effective ruler. What's so wrong with that? Well, of course, what Machiavelli is doing is trying to Teach one how to do that as a ruler without reference to any of the morality taught by the church. 
So, of course, the famous um, philosophy embedded within uh, Machiavelli's The Prince is the ends justify the means. In many ways, that's what he's teaching. Of course, he emphasizes the ends have to be good ends. They have to be virtuous ends toward a peaceful society. He says you, you can lie and cheat and steal. You know, the, it's controversial because the church, of course, teaches that that shall not be done. This is very much uh, contrary to some of the central teachings of the Christian church. But the emphasis is on practical business uh, of living together in a human society. In art, what do we see happening uh, between the end of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance? Uh, if you notice this picture, you notice uh, what is the central figure in this? This is one of Giotto's icons that is in the Uffizi Gallery. What do you notice about just the size of the Madonna here? Huge. What can we notice about the human figures there? Pretty small. Right? And so the emphasis here is on the bigness of God. Uh, you know, Giotto is the first artist who is doing stuff with perspective, which is being fully developed, and I'm sure Professor Froelich will speak more about this, with the later artists, artists of the Renaissance. Uh, but this is depicting heavenly reality. This is trying to look into a window about what heaven looks like. It doesn't have quite so much to do with our everyday life as human beings on the ground. God is big, we're small, and you notice there's no place for a signature there. Right? So what happens? Let's just go and then go to the, like, what, what might be called the High Renaissance period, where it's Michelangelo, Da Vinci, and Raphael. This is a painting by Botticelli called The Adoration of the Magi. Now, Renaissance artists made a lot of money, but they didn't do it by hawking their paintings on the street corner. They did it because they were commissioned by prominent families to paint pictures. And the families didn't say, just, just do whatever you want. Now, the families would say, okay, I want, I want it to be these colors, which were really expensive. You know, I want there to be a lot of vermilion, yellow, stuff like that. And they would order up a painting. So this is a painting that was commissioned by the Medici family. And uh, this is one of the Magi offering a gift to Jesus. Now, who might this be? Can you guess? Right here. It's one of the members of the Medici family, right? <laughs> Now, uh, you notice this figure over here in yellow. Any guesses as to who he might be? Botticelli. So here we have another, not just the family who's commissioning like uh, Cosmo Medici, but you know, here's Botticelli looking out at us and saying, that's right, I'm bad. <laughs> <laughs> I can do stuff. I got skills. So this is really illustrative of one of the main themes, again, of the, of the Renaissance. Is a kind of fun story. I don't know if there are art historians who would verify this, but I read that Michelangelo is said to have snuck into St. Peter's at midnight to sign the Virgin's dress. It wasn't signed, but there was the rumor that Donatello had done the statue. Uh, and so he went in and signed it to make sure people knew. So this wasn't done in the period before the Renaissance. Artists signing their work. Uh, Professor Froelich might point out uh, that uh, Gilberti's doors, that on the doors, wh what's at eye level? Anybody know? In Gilberti's doors? There's Gilberti and his son, their heads sticking out of the doors, looking right at you. So we're going to end here uh, in a discussion of humanism because this really does, I think, link to the, the flourishing of faith and art, not just in Florence, but really throughout Europe. This is a figure called Desiderius. I hope I'm saying his name correctly, Erasmus, who's called the Prince of the Humanists. Now, what do you think of when you think of humanist in the modern era? Because we think of secular humanists, people who are only emphasizing human ability. We don't need God, we got skills. But emerging at this time also is a Christian version of humanism that had some similarities with the type of humanism emerging in northern Italy that's elevating the, the ability of artists like Da Vinci and Michelangelo. Uh, but, but basically, Christian humanism is about this idea that human beings are God's good works. We do have skills, and so we should study the human being in order to understand more fully God. God gave us skills. The other theme of Christian humanism that starts to develop in this period of the Renaissance is this notion of going back to the sources. In the same way that the 
the artists of the Renaissance are going back to pagan classical subjects. Christian humanists are trying to go back to the original sources of the Christian faith. So Erasmus translated the New Testament from the original Greek into Latin and into the vernacular. It's the idea that we don't need the church to help us understand the truth. As individuals, we can apprehend it ourselves. It's a really important idea that sparks the Reformation itself. There's a lot of controversy that happens between Erasmus and Luther and free will and all of that stuff we could talk about for a long time. But it's important to know that some of the ideas, that some of the currents that are happening during the Renaissance are what create uh, the Reformation. John Calvin was a great humanist. If you want to know God, the other books of Scripture are, well, really, the other book of Scripture is creation. You've got to study creation if you want to understand God. And we have to study the human subject. We have to go back to the sources. Why is it that every Presbyterian minister is subject to studying Greek and Hebrew? Because John Calvin believed it was really important that we go back to the source of truth. It's going back to what's old to discover what might be truthful instead of what's newfangled. So, uh, the Renaissance in many ways is the discovery of man, or the discovery of humankind, an individual, and the celebration of human technology and ability. But we are in many ways children of the Renaissance and what it gave birth to. So, thanks for hanging in with me. I just want to say also thank you to the congregation for helping uh, provide this experience for me where I learned a lot and experienced a lot and it was certainly a great benefit to me. I hope it will be to this church. So thank you. Anyway, questions, comments? What area of Italy did I not go to that I might have wanted to? Well, I didn't go to Rome. Um, you know, one of my fatal flaws may be that uh, I was very ambitious in all the activities that I wanted to do. And some, in some ways, you know, people were saying, you're going to be exhausted at the end of that time. Um, but I really tried to not be so ambitious in where, where I travel. So yeah, Rome. And someday it'd be really interesting for us to take a group uh, from here to Rome and uh, a sort of learning, uh, traveling experience. May I? Did I have somebody guiding us in our experience in Florence? No, there was no one. I didn't sort of hire a company to go on a tour for the whole time. But what I did was uh, when there were opportunities, we hired somebody to take us through the Uffizi which is a really very effective way to understand. And we found that the quality of the guide just has so much to do with what you apprehend and take from an experience. We had an excellent guide who took us through the Uffizi. And by the way, on the website, just to promo that, there's a virtual tour of the Uffizi Gallery that you can take online. It's really, it's really very interesting. One thing that really impressed me about this, I need to think about that, is there were a lot of things that were very important but I think the challenge is so often we can go to extremes. So, you know, it's a period of sabbatical, so Sabbath. And the challenge, that I guess so what impressed me was the silence. Um, the time, eight days in complete silence, was a real important spiritual experience for me. Uh, but what's most impressive to me is how people can experience Sabbath in the everyday, and I don't know that I've quite learned how to do that yet. Uh, but I think that experience was helpful in giving the taste of what I'm doing. Well, thank you for hanging in with me and allowing me to share some of this with you, and I hope next week you'll come back, as I said, not for me, uh, but for the great poet Dante. It's pretty humbling to say much in 40 minutes about him, but uh, it's, it'll be an introduction to what he's about. So, thanks.